Tando Greetings, my name is Murray Nossel, and on behalf of the World Mother Storytelling Project and the Town Hall of New York, I would like to welcome you to this special event of the World Mother Storytelling Project. It's called Mothers Rising, and it's dedicated to mothers who have gone through loss, but have nonetheless risen up to be of service to others. Now, you may think that this is going to be a very heavy and depressing segment. After all, how many of us feel positive when we hear the word loss? Nonetheless, I am absolutely confident that this event is going to leave you feeling uplifted, inspired, and ready to face whatever challenges you may have in your life. That's my aspiration for you. From these mothers that we're hearing from today, we learn, we learn the important lesson of how to face what life puts in front of us and to do it with courage, with equanimity, and with the ability to carry on experiencing joy no matter what troubles we encounter. Dorian, how old are you? 11. You're 11, what grade is that? Six. You're in the sixth grade, okay. So this is called the World Mother Storytelling Project. And there's a mission to this project. And the mission is to teach kids of all ages how to listen to and tell their mother's stories. So that's what you're doing here. You're here to learn how to listen to your mum's story. And the idea is that all kids across the world, that's our wish, that kids across the world will really learn how to do this, how to listen to and tell their mum's stories. So how does that sound to you? Good. Do you feel like you know your mum's story very well? Yes. You know her whole story? You know everything about her life? No. <laughs> Very good. Well, today we're going to focus maybe on some stuff that you don't know so well, right? Mm. You learn something. Might as well, right? Yes. Okay, great, Dory. And so, so I want to tell you how this works, okay? When you are listening to someone's story, when you're interviewing someone, let's put it that way, when you're interviewing someone to get their story, what do you think is the most important thing? For you to do know what knowing what questions you're gonna ask that's a terrific answer knowing what questions what else what else do you need to be really able to do you you need to be you need to be able to comprehend what they're saying absolutely so and before comprehension even happens What's the most fundamental thing you have to be doing? No, no, being confident. Yes, absolutely. And I think you're quite a confident guy, right? Yes. What are you doing when you're, when someone's telling their story? You're listening. Yeah, you're listening. That's the most important thing, right? 
So let me ask you something. For you to be able to truly listen to your mum with an open heart, how do you have to be? What's your kind of way of being when you're listening to your mum with an open heart? Keeping in mind that she, you're going, that she's going through a rough time, and you shouldn't judge. Mom, can you tell me a story that you haven't told me before? Um, sure. I will tell you the story of um, when you were born. <laughs> Do you want to know what happened? Yes. <laughs> so um, the day you were born, um, Daniel, your older brother, mm -hmm. it was me, him, and your dad, and we were at home. And your dad had made some fried poly, some fried broccoli. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> and um, and I immediately became very sick <laughs> and um, went into a lot of pain. And so the joke between me and your father for a while was, um, you came, you you decided to come because the cooking was so bad. <laughs> and so um so then the pain was so horrible so then we were like well maybe it's time to go to the hospital the baby's coming and daniel was so worried because of course he had never seen me in labor um he came outside with me and dad he was like mom you want me to take you and he was just you know how daniel had a big yeah. heart and always caring um and uh and I said, no, you stay home because I need you to call Nunu and Grammy and a few other people. Because at that time, Grammy was still alive with us and, and all of our cousins. And mm -hmm. um, so he stayed home and made some phone calls. And, uh, and we went to the hospital and had you. What happened next? Well, when we got there, you weren't ready to come. <laughs> so you weren't ready to be delivered yet. And so we... Me and your dad sat in the hospital 18 hours waiting for Dorian to make his entrance. <laughs> and um, and uh, it took 18 hours and eventually um, you were birthed naturally and, uh, and the rest is history. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> What is the origin of my name? So um, me and your dad, actually, once we knew we were having a boy, we, we started working on your name. So your first name is Dorian. Yeah. And Dorian, it, your, one of your dad's very good because you know your dad's a musician. And one of his mentors is named Dorian. So that's where your first name came from. And then Miles actually comes from your grandfather, uh, uh, Pop Pop Smith, and Grandpa Smith in... Um, Louisiana, because Miles Davis is his favorite uh, musician. And so Dorian Miles, of course, Pollard is your dad's last name, but that's that's how we came to name you Dorian Miles Pollard. Is there anything else to the story? Um, about your name? Well, we had we had we we had a couple of funny iterations. <laughs> <laughs> um your dad always wanted Dorian. Um and then we played around with some some funny middle names that would have sounded crazy, but we, we stuck with Miles. <laughs> Thank you. We actually did a contest. I mean, let me say that that's how we got your middle name. So we did a contest with family members about what the middle name would be. And so Grandpa Smith, he had the best one, which was Miles. Mm -hmm. and so he won the contest. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Can we go into in depth of in depth of to what happened to Daniel? Well, he was um, assisting uh, his friend, um, a young lady, to retrieve her property from someone's home. And there was a huge um, argument about the property and um, between the two girls. And a guy came out that your brother didn't know. And again it was a huge argument so he probably didn't um nobody knew anything right so when he came out your brother and him had exchange of some uh, some words and then a fight ensued and during the fight this other guy 
um, used a gun in the fight and the gun um, shot your brother. Thank you. Thank you for asking. But what got me through all it, and, and as I said, you know, we're going on two years, um, it's just all the love and support from everybody. You and Zuri have been very supportive and you're, and all the fam, all of our family and all the friends who've been praying. And so community, the community that we have, we're blessed to have a community of, of love and support that has uh, helped me to get through it. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Do you have any scenes where you, we could see the love and support? Um, I think the, the, the largest demonstration of all the love and support happened at his memorial service at Fame Church. Um, I don't know if you know any people came, but the church itself seats 1,500 people and there was standing room only, which meant there was probably more than 2,000 people there because there are people outside, upstairs, downstairs in the sanctuary and nobody could find a place to park and people were parking five, six blocks away. So, and there were so many people just inside the sanctuary packed in there and um, the choir stand was full, the pulpit was full. And I think that's the, that's the epitome of love and support was that everybody was in the church with us to celebrate his life. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. What were some of the most memorable speeches that were heard at the memorial service? Well, there were three in particular for me. I think that that depends on whose list. On um, everybody had their own highlight, but for me, the three highlights were this. The first one was his coach, who talked about how Daniel was. Uh, he said specifically that Daniel was quiet but nobody would mess with him because Daniel, he was quiet, but he also made his presence known. And with a, and I remember him telling a story about, there was a guy that was trying to bully Daniel and Daniel just gave him this look like, man, you don't want, you don't want to start with me. And the bully stopped, like the guy just stopped messing with him. And he said, that's how Daniel was. He was quiet, but he made his presence known. Yeah. And then the second, um, uh, highlight was uh, his cousin Janice, who made everybody laugh by revealing that one day her and Daniel ditched school and she threw a party <laughs> at Mr. Ch at Chanel's house without nobody knowing. He threw a birthday party for her with all their friends and nobody knew. And then they, they, it was, they were sneaking, of course. And that was the first time any of us had heard that story. So we didn't even know that he had snuck and threw her a backyard party during the day while everybody was at work. And that made everybody laugh that, you know. And then the third memorable was when you spoke. And the thing that touched everybody's heart when you spoke was when you said that he lives in our hearts. He may not be with us physically, but he's with us in our hearts. And everybody was really moved by that, that you were able to articulate that so well and so clear. He may not have been, he may not be here with us physically, but he will always be in our hearts and our minds spiritually and that we should never forget him. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Heidi Schleifer and Noah Schleifer. I am so happy to be returning to the digital town hall stage with you and to continue our work on the World Mother Storytelling Project. And um, our audience, our viewers already met you on the inaugural World Mother Live. And now we have this really great opportunity to go into depth 
where Noah is not just going to be the dedicated listener for her grandmother's story, but Noah is actually going to actively generate the story through her listening and through her questions. Why do you feel this is the moment to listen to your grandmother's story? Why is this the moment, this particular moment in time that we have right now? Well, I mean, I think when you have to be apart from a lot of other people, like for example, I haven't actually seen my grandmother in person for a couple of weeks, um, which has been hard, but um, we can use this time to try and connect with each other more. Um, and I find that I've been talking more with a lot of people that maybe I didn't talk to as much before, but especially with my family. So, yeah. So, Nora, I'm going to hand this over to you now, and I'm going to invite you to ask your grandmother to tell you the story that you have been wanting to hear so much. Well, what I was thinking about um, was an interesting, was a turning point in your life that was interesting to me was um, like when you first came to America, like when you first came here when you were a young woman and like what that was like for you, that's something that has always interested me. So that's the one, when I came to America. So I was 20 when I married Zaidi and I landed in a country where the language was not really my language, even though I knew how to speak English, it wasn't my mother tongue, you know, French was or Yiddish. Uh, and so I landed also in a place where I knew no one. And Zaidi had prepared a lovely little apartment for us. It had a living room, a bedroom, and a, an amazing balcony. And he had put red fuchsias there and a table. He um, he decorated it so that it would be, you know, just a beautiful nest for us. And so I landed in that nest and... Uh, Zaidi and I would have breakfast on the balcony overlooking an enormous cemetery, military cemetery. So here we were, a young couple looking over, excited about starting a new life, looking over an enormous cemetery. You know, I missed my friends. It was a uh, a new place. I tell you, the, the friend that comes to mind is a very interesting friend. Her name is Dani van der Velde. And I've lost track of Dani. And maybe you're going to help me find her through Facebook or something. But Dani van der Velde was a very important friend because my parents, having survived the Second World War and camps and refugee situation, they really wanted to protect me from the world that they felt was anti-Semitic and they didn't want me to suffer what they had suffered and they wanted me to only have Jewish friends. And so I had a double life. I made, I created friendships that were was with non-Jewish people and Danny was my first friend I adored Danny and Danny adored me and we would take long walks and Danny belonged to an aristocratic family of Antwerp, generations of van der Velde people who lived there. And for me, you know, coming into a family that had just lost, you know, we lost grandmother and grandfather and aunts and uncles and cousins. We lost so many people to come into a family that had roots for gener for centuries, you know, in Belgium, in Antwerp, was something very new that I was just learning that, you know, maybe if you weren't Jewish at this time, you had aunts and uncles and cousins and 
grandparents and great grandparents and houses and you know you weren't just coming back from the war and trying to land in an apartment and make a nest for yourself but you were rooted and mm -hmm. that to me was a really important part of my friendship with Danny. So what what did your parents say like when you were growing up you mentioned that they were protective and you know that they didn't necessarily want you to be friends with people who weren't Jewish, um, like given their experiences. But what exactly did they say to you, like when you were growing up? What what were your conversations with them like about this topic? Yeah, you know, I don't clearly remember exactly what they said. It was an atmosphere of protectiveness. Uh, you know, I went to a Jewish school and then actually they took me out of the Jewish school because it was too expensive. And I went to public school and there they really let me know we'd like you to have Jewish friends in your new school. And, you know, I'm remembering now <clears throat> that um, because of Danny, I met a non-Jewish boy, a young man. And it was clear to me that my parents absolutely did not want me, not just to not have Jewish friends, but certainly not a, Jew a non-Jewish boyfriend. And I did meet a, a young man that I liked a lot. His name was Robert. Robert was a very good friend of Danny. And Robert and I became very close also. And Robert ultimately said to me the following, either you marry me or I become a priest. He was from a very Catholic family. And that just got to be too heavy for me. Like, oh my gosh, I don't want to carry the burden on my conscience that because of me, Robert becomes a priest. And then I did something. I decided that I was going to walk hand in hand with him in a place where I knew my parents would actually see us. And they did. And they actually took me home. And they, you know, it's so funny for me to say this to you. They put me in quarantine. You know, I'm, here we are at a time of quarantine. But they put me in quarantine. I wasn't supposed to leave the apartment. I wrote to a cousin in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I said, you won't believe this, Nelly, but I am in quarantine because my parents caught me with my non-Jewish boyfriend and they won't let me out of the house. Please invite me to Sao Paulo. I went on an adventure on the Rio Paraná in the Amazons, in the jungle, with a young woman I met who happened to be the cousin of Robert. How I landed with her, I don't know. But she was the cousin of Robert, and I immediately was drawn to create a friendship with her. And she, um, she and I went on this adventure, and we had a boating accident. We went on a boat that travels the Rio Paraná, and... The Rio Parana can go from very quiet to very wild. And we were sitting on the side of the boat on a platform that once the river became wild, the boat went like this, you know, where the we were holding on to the platform and the people on the boat tried to get us in. And because Luzi, that's the name of my friend, Luzi had had... Um, spina fibida, a kind of vertebral column deformation. She had spent a lot of time in a cast, so she wasn't very flexible. And I was very flexible. And so when the people of the boat tried to pull us in, they could pull me in, but they couldn't pull her in. And the platform and the boat came together and Lucy died instantaneously. And the people took her into the boat, but she was dead. And so I lost my friend Lucy. And I was with her, as you know, in the jungle. 
they took us off the boat and put us in a little chapel in the middle of the jungle. And here I was, I was 18, I was two years older than you are now, alone with my friend Lucy, who's dead in a chapel in the middle of the jungle. And, you know, my, I didn't know what to do. And it was as if a voice spoke to me and said, I'm going to guide you. You're going to go to a road. On that road, there will be a car. Take the car. It'll take you to a village where you'll find a doctor who can embalm your friend and where you'll find a phone where you can call her parents so they can send a plane to the jungle to get you. And so I did. I, I listened to that voice, and the voice told me where to put my feet because the jungle comes to your thighs. You know, it's vegetation and creatures, and I just, like, put my foot where the guidance told me to put my foot, and I did get to a road, and I did get a car, and a doctor, and called her parents. And two days later, they picked us up. And then when I went back to my cousin's home, I didn't want to live. You know, it's like if my friend Lucy dies, I should have died instead of her. I had a full life, and her life was not as full because of the cast, and I just didn't want to live. And I walked recklessly in the street so a car would hit me. And then I heard that same voice that said, look, I didn't guide you through the jungle in order for you now to end your life. And it was clear that that guidance was something inside of me and that I was a bigger purpose to my life. And I made a decision to go back home. And when I met Zaidi, something that brought us together, you know that he lost his sisters in not a boating accident, but a refugee boat that was torpedoed and all the survivors machine gunned and his sisters were killed. And so both of us had inside of us this enormous sense of loss in water, in a boat, and, and we... We bonded very deeply. What came into your listening? What was it like to listen to your grandmother telling this story about the accident? I mean, for me, it makes me think like, first of all, she wasn't that much older than me. And I cannot imagine going through something like that. It's like really, I mean, I really admire my grandmother because that's like a very that's a really hard experience and it's just it's like unimaginable for me it's like it's really it's really like it's hard to hear the story but I also really admire the way that she was able to get through it. When we were in LA I started to go to university and I would take my book book books and sit in that balcony and study. But you know, it's just for the first time I'm realizing about that cemetery, you know, because Zaidi and I carried a lot of loss, not just his sisters and Lucy, but the Holocaust, you, you know, all the family that had died, grandparents, you know, cousins and, I mean, people we've, we will never know. And suddenly, you know, here we are in an apartment overlooking an enormous cemetery. It never occurred to me, you know, that we were both really carrying so much grief and so much mourning and so much loss. And the view from that place we loved was, you know, the place of where people come to grieve their loss. That's something. The other side was life at its most vibrant, you know, and then the very big cemetery. And so, yeah, the neighborhood was hilly, and I adored walking around there. I loved being a student, and it was 
women's liberation period. And you know that I became a big woman's liver and was part of many demonstrations on campus. I've known the Los Angeles-based photographer Alon Goldsmith since we were both five years old. Now Alon documents mothers who've lost their children to gun violence. Alon was the one who led me to Rhonda Foster. In 1997, Rhonda lost her seven-year-old son, Evan, to gun violence. He was in the back seat of her car when he died. And right next to him was his 10-month-old brother, Alec. Next, you're going to see Alec interviewing his mother, Rhonda. So first, I'd like to ask what happened to start that day, that fatal day that Evan was taken from us, if you recall. Uh, well, um, I to get uh, Evan to school. And uh, of course, you went with us. <laughs> and um, he was, um, well, you know, he was excited all the time about about life. And that morning he, he commented, he, we, we would pray together, you know, on the way to school. And it was significant because that morning he, he said, thank you, Lord, for another day to breathe. I had strapped, strapped you, Alec, in, into the back seat, and Evan had gotten in the back seat, and we, and, you know, we were talking. And um, I, I um, put the key into the ignition. Do you remember what you were talking about? I'm sorry? Do you remember what you were talking about? Um, well, yeah. Uh, there, the person that was parked next to us, he had his, his radio very loud so you could hear the music. And there was a song that came on that, um, that was from my, my youth my, as a teenager. And so I was telling Evan about that, that um, the song was uh, about my youth. And to this day, I cannot recall what it was. What song it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the song that. Um, Remember the artist, maybe? No, but the song that is associated now mm -hmm. has always been since is um, Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On." Mm -hmm. or, yeah, mm -hmm. um, for me. Uh, so yeah, put the key in the ignition and raise my eyes, and and there were three young men in the parking lot, like about a hundred yards away, okay. and um, two of them had weapons, mm -hmm. and one was directly in my view and the other two were, were uh, to this direction. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna shoot this guy in my mind. That's what's, okay. you know. And, um, 
And I had just said to Evan that I was sorry we didn't get his trophy because um, the coach had left again. Okay. <laughs> and, um, we signed up for basketball, but he, he, we missed getting the trophy. So I said, I, I said, Evan, I'm sorry we didn't get your trophy. And at the same time, this is when I'm seeing, you know, right after I'm seeing this, the guy in, with the gun directly in front of me, you know, in, in my, you know, purview, mm -hmm. uh, it looked like he, he was uh, struggling with the gun, like, and um, uh, so my immediate reaction was putting it in the car in reverse and backing out in a U as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. And, and when I, when I was saying, and about how big is this parking lot? Um, it's it's a pretty nice size parking lot. Um, yeah. Well, the car is empty. It, no, it's pretty much empty. Okay. Because we, were, I was parked in the first row, and then they had, they had parked like, I think four rows back. The mm -hmm. the the shooters. And it's about seven o'clock. You said. Yeah, it was about seven o'clock. And so I just said that to Evan and Evan was saying to me, that's okay, mom. And, and he was stopped sentence because like I said, I'm backing out. I just said that to him, saw the guy with the gun, looked like he wasn't ready to shoot. Mm -hmm. I backed out in a U as fast as I could. The guy with the max 90 assault weapon was shooting it off at the same time that I was backing out. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you and think so Evan I, realized any of this? Could see any no. of what was going on? It was just you? No, uh, uh, nothing at all. Like I said, he said, that's okay, mom. And then he was cut off mm -hmm. because he had been shot. Mm -hmm. So he was cut off in mid-sentence. And, <clears throat> and, so, and when I came to a stop, I turned around to look at you guys because I thought, you know, because I was okay. I thought you guys, and so I'm checking on you guys, and I saw you first. And you had blood on your face. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw Evan and he was slumped in the seat. And I was like, oh, my God, they, they shot us. And so I panicked and I put the car in drive and I pulled the car up to the, the entryway, you know, the end of the parking lot, uh, the entryway up to the gym. And they have a barrier pole there. And so I basically it drove into the pole. Uh -huh. And... I jumped out of the car and I grabbed you in your car seat, just grabbed the car seat, mm -hmm. took, you out, took you, ran up to the gym, gave it to the first person I saw and told them to call paramedics that they're, you know, was shooting, which I'm sure they do because it, it was a Mac 90 assault weapon. 75 rounds were shot. I was going to ask, was, gonna was it very loud, loud, loud uh, in the, the car, car or, or you, 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 you said, said you, I, I can hear echo now. Um, uh, you were saying that Evan was like stopped in the middle of his speech, but it's, it's not, like yeah. when he was talking, uh -huh. um, but you, like you weren't aware that he was shot. So I was wondering like if it was, there were loud bangs inside the car at all, or it, it was 75 rounds right. shot. So it was very loud. All of that, you know, it was like, you know, mm -hmm. 75 rounds as I was backing out. Okay. Yeah. So you couldn't weapon. necessarily tell where the gunfire was going at all. I I wasn't really cognizant of that gun at the time. Mm -hmm. The one I was cognizant of was the one that was directly in my view. I knew the other person had a gun, but the fact because I I pretty much saw that right away. Two people uh, to to my um, right, mm -hmm. you know yards away um and i saw that one had a gun mm -hmm. and but the one that was directly in my view and what i learned was that his gun jammed and that's why he was having problems with the gun mm -hmm. but for me it was looking like he was he wasn't ready to shoot he was getting prepared to shoot and i think that is my opportunity to get us out of the way what's this like for you right now um it, it brings back the memories that i've heard of it in the past but i think this time it hurt it specifically hurt to hear um about when evan was cut off and she turned around and he was slumped in the seat um just because i i couldn't imagine um uh, thinking everything was all right thinking you had 
navigated your way out of that intense situation and turning around and seeing your son slumped in the seat like that. Um, so that was really hard to hear. But just going back to uh, Murray's question, um, I guess, how did, how did it make you feel to, to hear my reaction? You telling the story this time? Yeah, I, I was, like I said, I, I, I hurt um, when, when you said that. And um, just that you're experiencing the story and how you are right now. And um, it's hard to put into words that kind of pain, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't, like I can't imagine being in that situation. Obviously I was there, I was a baby, but in being in that situation in your shoes, as far as your children being in the backseat and um, obviously you do anything to keep your children safe. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine that type of despair and it's, yeah painful to think about. Kind of removed just from the facts of that, I was, I had a couple questions about how you personally felt in the aftermath. One being, did you place any like undeserved blame on yourself for what happened? Huh, that's um, quite something that you asked that question. Cause uh, as Murray had asked us, you know, to, um, considering reflections that we have. Uh, um, and even this morning as I was um, uh, thinking about us coming together again, mm -hmm. that um, basically, uh, and this is what I dealt with, you know, at the be in early time, I mean, you know, immediately after and had thought about well was impacted by it again with it being Evan's 30th birthday mm -hmm. and um, just um, well not just but uh, the fact that um, feeling that I failed as far as um, mm -hmm. uh, and what I sought to do you know, and getting us to safety since Evan right. was killed. And um, the different scenarios in my mind as far as um, what I, uh, how what I could have done, like, you know, instead of immediately reacting when I saw the guy with the gun who's jam the jammed, but mm -hmm. it looked like he wasn't ready to shoot. Um, like if I should have, you know, got out the car at that time and tried to get their attention that, you know, I'm a mother with two children or, or if I, um, you know, should have told Evan to duck. And I thought about if he ducked, mm -hmm. you would have been totally exposed. I mean, because you were in the car seat, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have been able to get, you know, it's like all the different scenarios that, that, I, um, or, or um, that I, I acted in my own strength as opposed to calling out to Jesus when, it, when I um, mm. saw what was before me. Um, just all the different, you know, scenarios. Uh -huh. um, and, but it's something because in, in my experience with that and, you know, when I was in therapy early on, you know, right after the experience, um, that brought to my remembrance what had happened in the car because we didn't get his trophy. The, 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 the coach had left early right? and we signed it for the basketball. And, and so as I was, um, we were getting, I was getting ready to back out. I commented to Evan that I was sorry we didn't get his trophy. And 
he said to me, um, you know, that's okay, mom. And that was it, you know, because the bullet's going. Mm -hmm. And Or he said, that's okay, mom. And anyway, um, and when I had um, come back to the car for the last time when the paramedics were there, and I asked them if Evan was, how was Evan? And they told me he was gone. Mm -hmm. And in a moment, I just said to God that he was going to have to hold me up. And so I came around to the other side of the car and got in the back seat with him. And um, I stroked his cheek. I told him I was sorry that I didn't get him out of the way in time. Mm -hmm. And that was brought to my remembrance at some point. Mm -hmm. um, in that early time <clears throat> and that he had uh... well one i was gonna say obviously you know that it wasn't your fault i mean like you weren't the one shooting. You had, you had to make a lot of split second decisions um, very quickly. And uh, mm -hmm. you're only human. I mean, you're a great mother, but you're not superhuman. You're not as a superhero. Um, so you did all that was humanly possible. So mom, can you tell us about that first experience of uh, you and dad going into the prisons and, and speaking with inmates um, and, and sh sharing our story uh, with them, uh, what that experience was like for you, um, what you remember about the, the minute details of that day. And we, uh, you know, introduced ourselves, our family with the pictures that we had, our family picture and, mm -hmm. and you know, began to, to share. Um, and, and what did it feel like for you first going into the prison? Like, was, was it uncomfortable or, um, or not, I guess, there, did you? There, there were uncomfortable aspects, primarily the, the fact of, you know, the reality of the prison, the heavy doors, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I, you know, I was highly anticipatory of it being a, 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 a positive experience and wanting to um, inspire the young people and um, let them know that we care mm -hmm. and and let them know that you know they can change their lives and, and that they're needed in society for the gifts they have and, and becoming part of the solution and not no longer being a part of the problem. Are there any inmates that you have spoken to in the past that you have seen like on the other side, like have gotten out of prison? Yes. Um, young man, Gabriel, who actually was the uh, cellmate with the killer of Evan. Oh, wow. Yeah. He, um, uh, there was one particular time it was on Evan's birthday that, um, your dad went to the prison, but I, I didn't go that time. Okay. And primarily because for, I didn't want to, that's not how I wanted to spend Evan's birthday. Uh-huh. And, um, but when he went, he ended up meeting Gabriel, who was the, as I said, cellmate. And he um, basically stood up and said that he had, um, and I think he had heard our story before or something because he had shared that he, yeah, he, he had. Um, he was supposed to get out early because of how he had done in prison. Mm -hmm. um, he basically, he had uh, killed someone as a result of he and his friends had gone to steal something out of a convenience store and a young man, Good Samaritan, was seeking to stop them. Uh, and mm -hmm. caught one of them. And um, yeah, he, you know, shot him. Mm -hmm. And and he said that he um, 
told he told the board that he wanted to to um, do his full sentence, and for for juveniles, that, I think that was to age twenty five, mm -hmm. and instead of getting out early, he wanted to do his full sentence as a result wow. of yeah, and he um, yeah he 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 truly changes like we've been in communication with him over the years. He ended up going to Biola College and getting married and um, yeah, yeah. My thoughts, they overwhelm me. My mind cannot contain the pain that is within me. Why? I long for understanding. I live to know the peace that comes from being sure of something. My eyes are blind to your ways, O oh Lord, yet I've seen you love and care, so I'll rest in your knowing, though I may not know, I take on your strength as though it were my own. Stand on the promises your word for me provides. I find therein the answer to the question why? why? I was attending school at Pasadena Community College and I was working part time as a waitress. And I remember ABBA, Dancing Queen, Marvin Gaye playing through the radios in the late 1970s. And uh, at this diner that I'm working at as a waitress, the sh one of the chefs there ends up becoming the father of my first child. And we end up getting a spot together. And uh, I catch him cheating on me, having sex with another woman at a nearby house about a year after we're living together. And I end up, I end the relationship right then and there. I end up enlisting into the Navy and uh, I, I get custody of our son. Our son's name is Anthony, and I get custody of Anthony, so I, I'm, I take him with me everywhere, uh, and I have to find him a babysitter everywhere I go to, uh, into, into all the different states and locations I'm stationed at, and uh, he's always, he, Anthony always com complained about all the different babysitters. He was about five or six years old at this time, a, a young boy. Slightly after this, I have a extended leave back into California. So I leave the military, go back to California. While, while I'm on my extended leave, I'm at this party and uh, I see this man and he is looking at me and I turn back around and I turn back and, he, and he's right next to me. And you know, we're, we're smiling at each other. We're, we're talking, we're dancing and we, we end up talking and dancing for the rest of the night. And then the next day he calls me up, this man and my, and, and, and uh, he calls up my stepmother actually, who, whose house I'm staying at. And she tells me, hey, some asshole just called up who didn't even know your name, who forgot your name. And I'm laughing, oh, oh no, no, he's a nice guy. So we end up going on a, a date together. And then we end up, um, uh, I actually end up being stationed in Japan overseas with the Navy for a year. But me and Laval, the man, we end up staying, we end up staying in contact on the phone, writing letters for a whole year. When we come back, we end up getting an apartment together. Um, and uh, in the apartments, me and it's Anthony, he's, we're hitting it all. Uh, Anthony is, is loving. A Anthony, Anthony calls Laval his main man. Uh, Laval is spending time with Anthony every day, playing sports with him. Um, uh, you know, but, but, but during this time, Laval actually had a relapse for his previous drug addiction, um, that he had a while back in his life. And uh, he left the house for a few days. And during that time, I threw all of his clothes out the house. I was gonna, I, I kicked him out of the house. Uh, he came back, he saw his, all of his clothes everywhere. And he, he, I remember he had a sad look on his face and he checked himself into rehab. And uh, after that, he never struggled with cocaine addiction after that. Uh, we, we actually, we, slightly after that, we got married. And then we had our first, our first son together, Michael, my second son. And um, 
and then shortly after that, in the year 2000, my son Anthony was actually murdered and killed. He he was he was murdered through a home robbery just after he had moved into his own house. Um, I, I I I almost committed suicide during this time. I. I you know, I, I I stabbed myself. I had mental breakdowns in front of my son Michael, and my, I remember my son Michael telling me, "Mommy, it's gonna be okay. Anthony's in heaven now. Anthony's in heaven." And uh, uh, you know, I, I, after this, I actually got involved in many different uh, groups that helped uh, ch uh, parents of murdered children and helped victims of crime, such as myself and my family and Anthony. Um, and I and I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna help people who sh who are victims of violence. And I actually got a job as a victim service representative, where I help victims of crime every day. And I've been doing this for the past ten years. Um, and the year and slightly after that, actually a long time after that, in 2016, my husband got uh, Alzheimer's, and we and our house went into foreclosure. And I was and 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 and. I, I remember telling my son, Michael, Michael, what would happen if I just kill myself right now? And Michael told me, mom, you can't kill yourself. It's, that's a terrible idea. You, you're such an amazing person. You have so much to live for. My photographer friend, Alon Goldsmith, also introduced me to another woman he'd photographed. Her name's Reverend Najuma. Now, Reverend Najuma has fought against violence and gun violence ever since she was a high school student. And then, two years ago, her son Daniel was murdered. Here I talked to Reverend Najuma about George Floyd and the fact that minutes before he died, he called out for his mother. What is this sacred bond between mothers and their children? Now, as a reverend, you know, I'm wondering, what is this, you know, how do you see what happened with George Floyd? Why did he call out to mother? Well, one of the things that I've shared at protests and in other conversations, Murray, um, is, is a few things. And for me, when I saw that part of the video or heard that part of the video where he called out for mama, um, a couple of things that came to light or something, something important that came to light later was that his mother had been gone, transitioned a few years earlier. So part of what, how I translated that moment and part of how I see that, that moment beyond just the atrocity of him being murdered, but also the spiritual component is two things that I've shared is number one, when he called out for mama, he was not just calling out for his mama. I do believe any mother would have been sufficient in that moment. What we know to be true a lot of times with children or any and even adults um, is that there is when when we when we are in distress um, because of the bond between a child and their mother, oftentimes children, young and old, want their mother because what mama represents, mama represents protection, mama represents nurturing, mama represents help, right? Because from from very from conception, we are trained that our mothers are our ultimate source of protection and covering and guidance. And so when he called out for mama, I believe any mother would have would have been any mother in the area close by would have been sufficient. He wanted that energy of mama, that energy of mama that protects, that energy of mama that that will do anything to to protect her children. There have been stories told about mothers who who do extraordinary feats to protect their child, to cover their child. And so I believe in addition to him calling out for his his mother and the spirit of his mother, any mother would have would have been um sufficient in that moment where he was in distress and needed protection, needed covering, needed someone to who, re, who would relentlessly help him. The other piece to that is that there's an energy around mama. Like there is there is a motherhood energy that is in, uh, you know, that he was also calling out to. Uh, but I also believe that that was a summons for mothers, right? Uh, for all mamas uh, to hear his cry and his plea as symbolic to the many voices, the many people who are suffering in this nation, not just to gun violence, not just to the atrocities that we see with police sometimes, but the many violence 
activities are happening in this world. I believe in injustices and racism. And so I also believe that it was a holy summons to mama's period to rise up because our children are crying out for us, whether they're crying out to us from the streets, crying out to us from cages at the border, crying out to us from within prisons because they've been unjustly sentenced, crying out to us from neighborhoods, ghettos where, you know, healthcare and education are bleak, are, are, you know, and just, uh, you know, abys abysmal. So I also believe that it was a holy summons to mamas everywhere to, to rise up in this season and get engaged in the justice work that is need that this nation so needs and what and, and also mothers have this healing nurturing and not to say fathers do not but we know that mothers carry with them this healing this nurturing that just is part of our makeup as mamas which is why we have the role that we have and so i just believe it was also a holy summons from mamas everywhere Oh, that is uh, that is so magnificently spoken, Najuma, because what you speak there in a way that I couldn't for a number of different reasons, one of which is that I'm not a mother myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you really capture this essential nature of mother. Yeah. And in so doing, you have articulated the vision of the World Mother Storytelling Project Wow. Yeah, because it is a summit. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that I've also shared, Mary, is all of us came from a mama. None of us came from anything else but a mother. And that's again, it is not to diminish the 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 God creative aspect of fathers, but all of us are birthed through the canal of a mother. And so there is a connection that just cannot be denied. Based on the heart-wrenching images of George Floyd calling out to his mother in the last moments of life, I made a conscious decision to focus Mothers Rising on mothers who've lost their children to gun violence. I reached out to Everytown America. This is the largest gun violence prevention organization in the United States. They led me to Brenda Mitchell. Brenda goes far and wide, telling the story of the murder of her son, Ken Ken. Here we see her sharing that story with her surviving son, Kevin. Because I was in Iraq, you know, I had just been there for a week and just getting there. And, you know, I'm in a tent that actually had been working all night long, getting vehicles ready. So I was actually down for a couple hours and you know, all of a sudden, my first sergeant comes in the tent and he's looking for me. Now, that's odd anyway, because, you know, the first sergeant don't really come look for you unless you're in trouble. And I know I did anything. So so he takes us, he's taking me to the tent and uh, saying the commander, the company commander wants to see me. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, automatically my mind is like, what's going on? And I'm I'm thinking because he asked me when the last time I talked to my family, not knowing that I had been at the phones last night and waited in line for maybe about 45 minutes. I called Jew, Ma, and I called Kiki and I talked to him and not knowing that that would have been my last time speaking to my brother. So it was crazy that he asking me this and I'm thinking to myself, like somebody must have died automatically. And it's like, I'm thinking maybe my grandmother, grandfather, you know, I'm thinking automatically the older people in my family. And so I get to the tent and um, she said uh, that uh, my wife needed me to call her. So I'm like, okay, so I called and she told me that she told me that um uh, he can she told me it was i sitting down and i said no i'm standing up what's going on and i'm like uh tell me what's going on she, and she told me he gone and i'm like oh who gone and she's like uh king is gone you know what I'm saying? he got killed and I'm, I was just like in an instant shock and like misbelief, of like 
I couldn't believe it. And I no, no, no. And I actually hung up the phone. And they had to make me call back. And I called back and you know, that's when she reconfirmed what she was saying and I still didn't want to hear it or believe it. So, you know, I, I just stormed out the tent and everything and um they and just left. They had to find me for on post so that they can I'm like, I just wanna go home. Just get me out of here. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. And you know, it's not that it's not it's not that easy getting out of Iraq. Okay. So I had to take a a, a Black Hawk to Kuwait and a Kuwait uh, uh <laughs> from Kuwait I had to get on the C one thirty to go to the airport in Kuwait. Then they put us on a commercial plane to in Kuwait to fly me back. And I'm sitting there and I was on the plane and um just wondering. All I can think about is how was my mother? I need to get to my mother. For me, the beginning my, was like, I got the call after you had got the call. But the events leading up to that were like, you know, I'm on the plane and, you know, I'll, all I can think about is you because, you know, I don't know how you're doing. I haven't really talked to you, you know, and it took me a couple of days to get home. And, you know, the whole time I'm flying on the plane, I'm looking out the window, like kind of zoned out and just really paying attention to everything outside that window. And all I could think about and envision was like kind of a, a, a you in grief and pain. And, and you know what I'm saying? It, it hurt me because I wasn't there and I couldn't do anything. I, I, could, I had no emotion. I couldn't cry. I couldn't do anything until I saw your face and I saw how you were. And to my surprise, when I get home, you know, you were the one who like kind of flipped the role and like you trying to be strong for everybody else. And it kind of threw me for a loop. But I know I remember when I first got there and you looked me in my face, I looked you in your face, you already knew where my emotions were. So you told me, you remember you said you want to go to the back? (laughs) <laughs> and I said, yes, and I, that's the first time, and I, I literally broke down in that room, but it, I know that could happen until I saw you. And when your brother died, who was my gift, you know, that made my life okay, and you always called him the child of the promise, I think is the word that you always use for your brother. Um, and he was my promise. And um, I knew in that moment that a decision had to be made. God prepared me and he strengthened me. And I just did not want, you know, I love the world and I love people and I didn't want my life to change. I didn't want my worldview to change. I did not want to see life anyway than what I was realizing it to be. And I didn't want to be bitter. I did not want to be one of those people that, you know, could never see the good in life and and and, and not be able to say, I have joy. Um, it took a long time to get back to that joy. Right. Well, because, and that's interesting because I know it surprised me a lot when, you know, I came to you and I was asking you about going back to Iraq because I was at, I knew that I didn't want to abandon my people, my, my soldiers. I wanted to go back and, you know, do my duty. That's my duty. I was, that's what I signed up for is my obligation. I love those people. Like I love my family, you know, but I've also always put you and the rest of my family ahead of anybody else if they in need. So when I asked you, do, do I go back or do I stay? And you t- and you said, what did you tell me? <laughs> I told you that I cannot make that decision for you. And if you feel an obligation to go back to your band of brothers, then you need to make that decision because your destiny was not in my hands and that I could not save your brother in a free country. I can't allow 
your destiny to be in my hands and something happens to you here. You just use that basically to change the whole narrative on your life, you know, after. And that, to me, that is the true definition of a mother rising. Because oh, yeah. you did rise. You rose from did your rise. dark place. Your dark place. Yeah. You, you, you visited for a little while, but you refused to stay. The PTSD had moved me to a place of extreme hypertension. So I could not keep my blood pressure down. Then, I mean, I was going like, my last one where I was just like over, was 250 over 110. So that was one issue. And then I had a primary care who um, was great, you know, and um, first time seeing me um, felt that I needed counseling. And I said, are you serious? I'm dressed to go to a new job. I got everything coordinated. What do you mean you're not recommending me to go home? And she said, you can go, but I wouldn't recommend it. I said, well, how am I going to go to a new job? If you're not going to recommend it, I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm broken and I'm fragile. And what I'm doing is not working. So I'm going to do everything that you tell me to do. You went to D.C. It, it wowed me. It's like, oh, I'm, are you serious? You in D.C. talking to uh, senators and congressmen. And I'm like. Wow, this is like totally amazing. You reinvented yourself and look at the things that you've done. You never, that, that you told me, you never thought that, you know, sometimes you look back yourself and you never thought that you would be on some of the stages and the doors would open for you that have opened for you. So, yeah, you just amazed me with a lot of the accomplishments. And like I said, when you were in D.C., I, it really wowed me and like, you know, but you know what? What what like what were the conversations and stuff like when you were there? I went to meet with um, one of the senators, and I was in Washington D.C. And I told him, um, I just told him the truth. I had a husband that has retired from the military and has been in armed services as well as a public service in um, law enforcement. And I have a son who followed his father into the service. And what do I tell them? You know, my husband's favorite dessert is mom's apple pie. I said, and so when we look to this house that's supposed to be so great, it has lost its glimmer. What do I tell my husband who after serving for freedom for his country, my son goes over to Iraq for Iraqi freedom. And a year later, I'm sorry, a week later, he has to come home and bury his brother in a free country. We have to ask, what can our country do for us now? What would you have me? I'm at the foot of our democracy here. Right. What do I say to my husband and my son who have given it their all? And how do I justify that my son was buried? My husband's name went into the ground. How, what do I go back? And so, and even me, I lost cognitive memory. There were no resources available for me to heal. How do you tell a mother who has her heart snatched out that it's okay to continue living and there's no resources to show her how to live without her child? I understand. So you say second generation got to do it all over again and then mm -hmm. pick up the slack because there's nothing out there for them. But I mean, so like, was it a was it a Q and A? What what type of feedback did they give you to those questions? Well, I kind of kept on a speaking in a tour uh, because of the stance that I took on post traumatic stress and trauma. This one was so moved, and he was a staunch um, senator against um, 
common sense gun laws. Um, now, who was that? And I don't really want to say his name. He's no longer a senator um, because of that. But um, but he did go back to his community and began to bring forth bills um, for in favor of common sense gun laws. And he was very moved in my conversation with him. And you could see visibly he was moved. And, you know, I went to another senator's town hall um, from Connecticut, Senator Murphy. And he says, what is the one thing that we're not talking about? And I said, post-traumatic stress and trauma, trauma-informed resources. And I'm satisfied with that because Senator Murphy attended um, every town survivor networks um, conference, Dunstan's University. And at that conference, he hit it out the park. He spoke about trauma, post-traumatic stress syndrome, better than I could have said it with the exact same level of passion that I said it to him. And so it tells me that my living is not in vain and the work that I'm doing is not in vain. And I continue to be a forerunner for post-traumatic stress trauma. And um, I'm helping in groups now that deal with post-traumatic stress and trauma and also social justice. So my life and my, my, my plate is continue to be full. I want to ask you a final question. Please. Najuma. What do you think would happen in this world if a billion children listened to their mother's stories the way Dorian listened to your story? A billion mother stories, what would happen? I do believe um, our world would be changed. A lot of times we're, we are busy parenting and raising, and especially now in this, tech age, we're not doing a lot of storytelling. There was a time where storytelling was the entertainment, right? You got, you sat around the village mother, um, you sat around at the table when there was no TV and there were times where you could share stories. We live in an age, there's so many distractions. Stories are not shared and it's, I don't think it's because parents or mothers don't wanna tell I think we're just busy being mothers. Um, but I do believe that the world would be shaped differently. There's so many, and you know this, Murray, so many people who learn things about their mothers and their fathers after they have transitioned. There was a movie about, a really good movie. I think it was uh, Bridges Over Madison or where these, you know, The Notebook. All of these movies are about adult children who read about their mother's stories after they've transitioned and they're changed by it because they saw mom one way, not realizing she had this other, all this other stuff happening that she was either protecting them from or maybe was too ashamed to share. I mean, there's all these movies, there's so many great movies about that kind of thing. So I think we would be shaped differently if we understood, you know, there are women who find out their mothers did cheat and realize, oh, mom wasn't perfect or their mothers had, you know, you know, actually did make very difficult choices when you thought she wasn't, you know, and it, and it just changes adults. And so I think what this Mother's Rising has done for me is reminded me to tell my kids their stories. You know, if I would have wished for anybody who could articulate the vision of the World Mother Storytelling Project, you have done it with absolute perfection. Wow, thank with, you. With sheer, with the sheer brilliance, not only of your, your, you know, your vocation, your calling as a as a minister, but also of the the tremendous intelligence that has come to you by virtue of being a mother. And so thank I really you. thank you, Nigeria. Thank you for having me. Thank you. For having me, it's uh, this has been a, an honor, and, and I'm and I'm sincere when I say this is really, it's a, it is reminding me the importance of sharing stories, and we know it. 
Like it's an African tradition, right? We know it. It's it's the Jewish tradition and we know it, right? It's the way Jesus taught the telling stories. So we have to get back to that. So I'm I'm excited to share this the the 25th with my community um, and remind you to get back telling your kids your stories. My music, which is a letter, a song for Kin Kin, was created um, with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra um, and Yo-Yo Ma, who wanted to do something for the mothers of Purpose Over Pain. Um, and I was one of the mothers that was able to write a song for my son. What I did not realize was in writing that song, I had actually expressed every emotion that I felt that night in, in my healing process with Ken Ken, but more so on the night that I lost my son. I did not know until I put those emotions and feelings to words what it was that my experience was in that moment. And in directing them how to position my music, I told them that it needed to have a lot of highs, high notes and a lot of lows. And then there would need to be a pause where you hear the three chimes go that allows me to stop and be able to see that my son is gone. My name is Brenda Mitchell and I dedicate this song to my son, Kenneth Mitchell Jr. You were my love, you were my heaven. i